Good evening, everyone. I am James Ernest. I am a game inventor, and about 24 years ago, uh, I started a game company called Cheap Ass Games, and that's what we're here to talk about, the whole history of it. And it's fresh in my mind because I just finished the book called Cheap Ass Games in Black and White, which is a retrospective of that entire career. Um, a little bit of game design, a little bit of history, and the rules for more than 100 games. Uh, we didn't put all the components in the book, there just wasn't space, but there's certainly like, if you're a researcher, a game designer, or anything, and you want to look at some of the rules for the games that I've made, that's, that's part of what the book is about. I owe the world another book. I want to do a book called uh, Games on Paper, which is a more, more of a game design specific book. Uh, the kinds of games that I like to write. And I did a class at DigiPen. I don't know if you know what DigiPen is, but it's a, a computer game uh, design college up in Seattle. I taught Introduction to Tabletop for them one year, and sort of the notes from that class are sitting at my house waiting to become a book, but as much work as Black and White was, the board game design book is going to be even more. I need to find the time to do it. Looking forward to it, though. So welcome. Um, I don't know what you guys expect out of this hour. Um, uh, the, the pitch was, let's talk about the history of Cheap Ass Games. So I will run through that and uh, interrupt me. And if any questions form in your mind, you know, just throw them out there. Uh, happy to take questions about anything during or after, and, and we'll just see where it goes. Um, and of course, it's all fresh in my mind. It was, it was fresher in my mind when I wrote the description for this panel, because I was in the middle of writing that book. But then I turned the book in about two months ago and went on vacation and enjoyed my vacation and forgot all of it. <laughs> and now I'm back here dressed as though I am a freelancer uh, trying to get uh, more game design work. That's really what I want to do. I, I retired, if you will, from the job of publishing because that's not the job I'm really good at. I like writing games and I'm trying to find a way to do more of that. So let's go all the way back to Let's say 1993. We'll do flashbacks once in a while to my early childhood, but let's start in 1993. Um, my, uh, my friends are all friends with people at Wizards of the Coast, which is a tiny little RPG company in Seattle, Washington. And because we have friends in common, they come and invite us, uh, my wife and I, to invest in their new project, project which is Magic the Gathering. Uh, it's going to be called Mana Clash, and it's going to be amazing. They might make as much as a million dollars. What really happened with, with Magic was Richard Garfield had been shopping Robo Rally around uh, for a long time and brought it to Peter Atkinson at Wizards. And Peter said, this is a really expensive game. Can you make me something cheaper? And actually sort of described what Peter wanted, which was a portable game that you can play in a few minutes while you're waiting in line or between RPG sessions or something. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that describe what Magic is came out of Peter Atkinson. Richard Garfield said, yeah, I think I have a baseball trading card game that I could morph into a fantasy game for you, and that made magic. And, and I was sort of there to witness all this, and my wife wrote a, uh, edited a fanzine that ran for three issues uh, until she got a job at Wizards in the sales department and had no time for such things. Um, I edited that magazine, and Richard Garfield wrote an article for us about exactly that story in that time period. And uh, the very first thing that I did for Wizards was volunteer to rewrite the Magic Rulebook because the Alpha Rulebook was unreadably bad. It's what happens when you let your developers write the, uh, the uh, reference material. It was pretty unreadable, and so I was like, please let me volunteer, let me just rewrite your rulebook. And I wound up rewriting the Magic Rules a total of four times, four different editions. Only three of them actually saw publication, but like that was sort of one of my jobs for them was technical writing. I came out of a background of entertainment. I was a professional juggler when I was younger. I worked cruise ships and street fairs and stuff like that. Um, I went to engineering school, so I had a mathematics background as well. Uh, so with entertainment, math, graphic design, I'd done some publishing myself. I'd done some uh, comic book and, and book publishing myself uh, out of my house. Had a lot of these skills that applied sort of to working freelance for wizards. I did technical writing for them as well, I did editing. Uh, I did pitch a game to Wizards, a, uh, a trading card game that I wrote with Paul Peterson. They optioned it, but then they realized that they had already promised so many other games that it never came out. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen to that game. I look at it now and I'm sort of embarrassed by it. I would like to release it, but then again I wouldn't. So I don't know what's going to happen to that game. But, 
But uh, uh, I never actually got a job at Wizards R&D. Although I did have some opportunities when people came by my desk and said, hey, you're a game designer, would you help me with this game? And, and there's details of all of those things in the book. But um, around late 95, there was around layoffs at Wizards where they were restructuring and they were killing a lot of their game lines. And that was my time to jump ship. Uh, my wife had actually, she, she had risen to uh, director of sales and she had just gotten a raise that was bigger than my entire salary. And I was like, okay, well this is a, an omen of some sort. So I'll jump ship, I'll take the layoff package and, and I'll try to become a freelance game designer. But really, I had seen how hard it was for established designers to sell their games in this industry. And I was not established at all. I had a bunch of game designs that were half-baked which if you played any of the early cheap ass games, you know I never really fully cooked them all the way. And I wanted to make games and sell games at a rate that was way higher than I thought I could actually push them through. So early 96, I said, let me look into possibly self-publishing. That's the beginning of cheap ass games. I've got a bunch of games, I've got a bunch of industry connections. And the fact that my wife works at Wizards is pretty useful because when distributors don't pay their bills to me, she knows about it and she can hold up their magic. <laughs> Not everyone has that lever. <laughs> um, so during 1996, I put together the plan for Cheap Ass Games. And what Cheap Ass Games wound up being was a garage band studio, a super, super cheap, printed on my laser printer. We don't include any spare parts that you can steal from other games. We include only the cards the boards, the rules, the, the bare bones. I wanted to sell these games for $2. That was ambitious. We wound up selling them for 5 or $6, but it was still nicely cheap. And at a time when a lot of us were in school and needed cheap games to buy, and it was good timing for that. I had noticed over the last couple of years of going to trade shows like Gen Con that there was a gulf in the under $10 market sort of waiting to be filled. There was a... Um, it was sort of the early days of digital prepress, and so everyone's games were looking better and better, but they were also costing more and more. And Magic helped raise that bar. Magic the Gathering decks are selling for $9 a pop, and so new games that are not collectible, like Lunch Money, look out there. And I know John Nephew's a weird example, but, but he looks out and says, I could probably sell Lunch Money for, for 20 bucks. I think that thing debuted at 19. It might have come down to 18 or 17 in its lifespan, but here's a double deck card game that isn't even in full color for 20 bucks. And so there's very little in that under $10 space that I knew from when I was in high school buying, you know, uh, Steve Jackson games and, and, and even D&D stuff that was, that was actually affordable. Let me jump into that and see if I can dominate it and let me make my company look as small as I can. We were joking earlier that I, I tried to make it seem like I was the only guy there, but really I mostly was. Um, I didn't, I was never impressed by companies that started with really grandiose names like Super Duper or everywhere, you know, Consolidated Publishing Entertainment Enterprises, but so instead I said, I'm not going to look too big, I'm going to look too small. I'm going to make everyone who picks up these games feel like they're the only one who knows about me because they will then feel like it's necessary for them to advocate and share with their friends, and it worked pretty well. Um, aside from having, an, you know, in, in the industry and knowing distributors back doors, I also had retail stores and certainly customers who picked it up really early and found out that Cheap Ass Games was a the thing they wanted to play. And I knew that that business model meant I'm not going to make a lot of money on one game. I need to make a lot of games. I want to make a lot of games. That's good. But I need to have a steady stream of new products coming out. So every couple of months, I'm bringing out a new game. When we launched, we had six games. The six games that we went to our very first convention with were Kill Dr. Lucky, Before I Kill You, Mr. Spy, <laughs> Pregnant Pause, um, <laughs> Bleeding Sherwood, Ben Hurt, Spree, did I just name five or six? Five. And another one. <laughs> oh, probably Get Out, that was number six, that's right. I used to know these stock numbers by heart. Um, we went to SlugCon in November of 96 with games that I had printed on my laser printer and uh, ran a little table and at that con we designed new games. Uh, the we in this is Toivo Rovinen, who was uh, a, a notorious Cheap Ass Games employee from the very beginning. He was my friend since grade school. He moved out to Seattle a couple of years after I did. I worked for him for a while. Uh, for the city, he worked for me at Cheap Ass Games, and we've been just good friends forever. Uh, Toivo and I worked at Con 
at the con, we came up with a dice game called Zodiac. We played it just on the table when nobody was there. Um, we came up with a card game called Give Me the Brain that came out pretty shortly after that. And, uh, and that's been a tradition ever since. Like, I am always at these cons testing and coming up with new games. Uh, at this show, I'm working for Greater Than Games now, and so I brought them a, a new prototype of a game I've been developing for them. But at dinner, Paul Bender is like, hey, I've always wanted Game X, you know? Just, he just spits a theme at me, and I'm like, okay, we can do that. That sounds really fun. I know what that game's gonna look like. There's no mechanics for it yet, but I know what the box is gonna look like, and that's enough for me to get like, excited about it. Uh, the Cheap Ass Games line was like that. Like, we designed the line to look similar so that the line was the product, not an individual game. But when you went to your game store, you should recognize the trade dress and say, oh, look, it's a new game from Cheap Ass Games. I've had a better than 50% success rate with these things. Let's try that. It's only three bucks. We had a sign on the wall that said, if it's only five bucks, who cares if it sucks? <laughs> no, it started with, if it's made out of wood, it better be good. Yeah. <laughs> if it's only five bucks, who cares if it sucks? That uh, wasn't really where we were coming from, but it was kind of like, yeah, we understand that these are experimental games and that not everyone is going to like every title in the line, but someone is, is going to like each one. Each one of these games is for someone, and that was really kind of liberating to be able to just do these low budget things. I did the first runs on my laser printer. Later on, I found a local printer who had a shop in his house. He had a paper cutter in his kitchen. He had a print shop in his basement. He could make me runs of 200, 500 games. These are manageable print runs. These, this is an amount, I'm not in over my head at any of the early periods in cheap ass games. In fact, the first time that I really had to raise money to print a game was when I printed Falling. Uh, so, I think it was, it was a Gen Con in Milwaukee. I think it had to be, uh, I'm gonna guess 95. The numbers in the book are accurate, but. Um, walking around the Gen Con and 96, 97, whenever it was. Still in Milwaukee, I know that. And I just thought of the name Falling. That's where this game came from. I wanna do a game called Falling, and the very first thing about it that I knew was that everyone is falling. The very first thing I saw was the idea that there would be an advertisement which was a sign on the side of a road that said falling rocks and someone had fallen past it and spray painted an exclamation point at the end of it because falling rocks. <laughs> Terrible ad, but that got me thinking about what is a game called falling and what is it like if everyone is falling, the game is about trying not to hit the ground first or rather you win by hitting the ground last. And I said, if I want to make this feel like the real thing, not that I have any experience, by the way. Uh, I've never jumped out of an airplane. I don't want to. It's got to be a real-time game. I don't know what a real-time game is, but I know I want to make that. Or rather, I know that video games have time pressure, but I don't know a lot of tabletop games that have time pressure. So I know the feeling that I'm going for, but I'm not sure exactly how to execute it. The only real-time tabletop game that I ever played was called Ice House by Andy Looney. And it's very slow. Everyone's going at once, but you're reacting to what other people do, and there's, there's geometry and how the places are pieced, pieces are placed, and it's not a racing game. But it is real time. It is everyone going at the same time and doing the same thing. And I thought, okay, it's doable. Let's try it with a card game. Because I was playing blackjack a lot during that time, falling is kind of based on blackjack. And the way it works is there's a dealer who is the referee if necessary, um, who gives cards to everyone else. And those cards just accumulate in a stack, and if nobody does anything, there are ground cards at the bottom of the deck, just like in real life. You don't have to worry about the ground at all, right at the end. And as those ground cards get dealt out, those players are eliminated until the last player gets the last ground card, and that's the end of the game. However, the other cards are instructions for the dealer, which you can play, and that will make the dealer perhaps give you two cards, or perhaps give you no cards. The skip card is really useful at the end, and you don't want to get a ground card. Anyway, that's the structure of the game. But the point of this story is about how do we pay for it? Because it's a real-time game and the cards get thrown around a lot, they're going to get ripped up. If I print them on the crappy Kinko's paper that I'm printing all my other games on, it will not survive one play, much less like the lifespan of a card game. So we really have to make a high quality card game, which means going to a big printer. That means printing a lot of games. That means investing $10,000. Crazy money, right? Way more than I had in petty cash. And so 
because there was no such thing as Kickstarter at this time, foreshadowing, I asked my friends and family to lend me the money. Uh, we didn't call them shares because that's a magic word. We called them bites, I think. But whatever they were, everybody who invested in that game had a little piece of the profits, and, and uh, we raised the $10,000, printed the game, and got our first color card game out there. And for the very first time, we tried to create an imprint called James Ernest Games. This was not a cheap-ass game at all. This was a regular price game at $10, why we're competing with everyone else. But of course, because it had a CAG stock number on it, and because everyone ordered it from cheap-ass games, and because I was cheap-ass games, whether I put the cheap-ass games logo on the box or not, it had a cheap-ass games logo on it. And every so often, we've had to try to make that distinction and failed, um, with the most recent example having been TAC. Does everybody remember TAC, a beautiful game? It's a $55 board game made of beautiful wooden pieces and, and lovely uh, uh, expensive board art. Let me tell you how expensive that board art was. <laughs> we raised money for that one on Kickstarter. We did pretty well. It was more than $10,000. And we didn't put a Cheap Ass Games logo on the box, but if you read about it on Board Game Geek, you'll see comments like, this game costs too much to have a Cheap Ass logo on the box. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> check the box. <laughs> so it's a label that's been hard to escape. Uh, James Ernest Games tried to be an imprint for a while. Um, we also did an even smaller imprint called Hip Pocket Games. We did a series of card games that were even cheaper than cheap ass games. and They were about four bucks. And that's a fairly successful imprint, but they're still also cheap ass games. So Falling was our first color card game. We did a whole bunch of black and white board games like you see here. They typically came in envelopes such as this. So you've got uh, cards in here that are wrapped in a, in a paper band that is cut out of free magazines. Collector's items, still in bands. Very valuable. <laughs> this was originally $5. It's probably worth as much as 6 today. <laughs> um, we did stuff as cheap as $2. Devil Bunny Needs a Ham was $2 because it's three pieces of cardboard. It's a board, uh, that's two pieces. A set of rules, that's one piece. Um, and. If you got a good version of this, it also had a tiny little fold-up Devil Bunny pawn. Our, our printer, man, we used every square inch of that press sheet. We, uh, whenever there was an extra business card size, but we all got new business cards, right? Whenever there was a strip or nine cards, okay, I can make a new game that uses nine cards. Uh, I have Nexus here. Nexus has the distinction of being the only game I've ever printed before I designed it. It's true. So the cards in Nexus are just this geometry here. It's just like nodes and, and connections and whatever. Um, and there was nine extra pieces of, 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 of space on a press sheet. I said, okay, this is a fairly mathematically described set of cards. I will make these cards because I'm going to press tomorrow. We will bring these cards into the house. We will play with them. If we come up with a game, then we will use these cards. <laughs> and if we don't, we'll put them in the trash, which is where they were going to go anyway. So yes, Nexus actually is not only a decent game, it got in, it was, got in the Games 100, it was the first uh, Hip Pocket game. Most of the Hip Pocket games got in the Games Magazine, Games 100. Uh, so I'm pretty proud of all of those. Falling was our first color card game. Uh, shortly after that, we started doing um, games in a, a double deck box. So they, they price raised up to 15 now. We're looking at 110 cards in that in that full color box. We never did a board game. We talked a lot about doing a deluxe edition of Kill Dr. Lucky in an actual box with actual pieces. But uh, for some reason, we just like, that seemed like a lot of money to throw together. Uh, and even though after a few years, we were operating with some money in the bank, it was still like, wow, a board game is an even bigger expense, you know, $30,000, $40,000 to do a press run of this thing. And we don't know if we're gonna sell it. That's the big problem of being in business in the late 90s, is you don't know that you're gonna sell what you're making. That's why it was so nice for Cheap Ass to be able not only to do small press runs, but because we did a lot of our assembly in-house, a lot of the money wasn't actually in the box until the box was sold. Our, my basement was full of spare parts, often in vastly different quantities, um, but getting assembled kind of on demand, and that assembly is a big part of the cost. So I don't have a lot of money in, in inventory because of that reason. But if you print an entire box game and have the factory build it, that's a huge amount of space in your warehouse, in your basement warehouse taken up, a huge amount of money soaked in inventory. And so we never actually made a board game in the sort of traditional, it's already built kind of way. 
we did an experimental game called Dice Land. I don't have a copy of that here, but it was a it was a paper dice game. And paper makes it sound flimsier than it was. It was heavy cardstock, and the dice were very serviceable and lasted as long as you wanted. Um, but it was a combination tactical and dexterity game. You make your they're, they're paper dice. They're about two inches across, and Printing on paper dice gives you the luxury of a, a vast amount of detail. Like I had played collectible dice games before, but they were molded plastic. And so they're really hard to read, especially if they had to all be different. Here's printed paper. I can put artwork on this and, and details in all the corners and arrows and all this stuff. So here I've got this piece. To bring the dice into play, you have to throw them. You can hit other dice in play. That's all part of the game. You just can't knock them off the table. But then once they land, they're like miniatures. They have a defacing, and they have a weapon, and they have damage. And when you damage the dice, you actually push down on one of the corners to show a slightly weaker face. And it rolls down by a pattern until it gets to the weakest face, in which point any damage kills it. Unfortunately, when you make a hybrid game like this, you appeal only to the intersection of those two kinds of players. So people who both love miniatures games and dexterity games Love it. That's me and a former blue man named Jason Long and nobody else. I think there, there's a couple people at Great Event who really like Dice Land, and I give them this warning, you know, I don't know if you're going to sell a lot of this. We didn't market it as well as we could have. We tried. I made a lot of expansions for this game. I really loved it because uh, I, I bought a really big printing cutting die and, you know, I might as well use it again. <laughs> Never could get it to take off, but I sure loved that thing. But that might have been our biggest most expensive experiment during phase one of Cheap Best Games. All in all, we probably made about 150 titles in those first 10 years. And over that period, we found ourselves living more and more under the weight of our accumulated inventory. We didn't exactly keep everything in print, but then we didn't exactly sell out of everything either. There was really sort of three categories of game. There's one that sells so well that it's worth reprinting every year. That's Unexploded Cow, that's Give Me the Brain, that's Kill Dr. Lucky. Those are our money. Then there's the games that sold well enough that we ran out, but they weren't good enough to reprint. That's money too, that's not stuck in the warehouse. Then there's the games where even the first press run never sold through, and we still have those. So our catalog is a weird mix of evergreens and terrible games. <laughs> Oh, we still have a lot of this. You guys didn't want any of this? We're giving it away now. It's free. Take it. We marked it down. It's hard to do a markdown through distribution, by the way. Not fun. But, uh, but that accumulated inventory, especially the old stuff, wound up being more than we wanted to carry. At this point, we as myself, my wife Carol, and uh, four employees. We had an office across town, a uh, marketing director, uh, uh, two warehouse people, just like you know, for me, a huge company. I don't like running companies. I'm no good at it. And so in, I think the year was about 2003, 2004, we cut it off. We said, look, we are at a point now where we're making more gross, but we're not making more net. We're investing in color games that aren't making us as much profit as we would like. We're competing with a whole bunch of other games that are also not cheap. And we have two choices. We can try to grow to a point where we're profitable again and see if that works. Or we can shrink ourselves back to what we used to be, which at this point kind of means taking us down to zero. So we put the company on hibernation mode, and it just so happened that my friend Joshua, who was also a small game publisher, even smaller and older than Cheap Ass, Bone Games, was Joshua Howard's baby, and he was doing uh, downloadable PDF versions of his miniatures war games uh, years before Cheap Ass came on the scene. He was also, he had a day job, that's how he survived. He worked at Microsoft, he had for 15 years, and he said, I'm, I'm at Carbonated Games right now, it's a game studio inside Microsoft, you should really come and interview for this job. So I went to work at Microsoft as the game design manager at Carbonated, and we made such, uh, such many games, I don't know, we worked on web games and uh, uh, Xbox games, I, I created the Fable 2 pub games, if you are familiar with that, it was a standalone product that was all, had games that were also inside Fable 2, so you could play these games before Fable 2 shipped, and then take the money that you won and have it in Fable 2. Wow. I didn't care about that, but I cared about the casino games because I love casino games. Um, but, uh, but I worked at Carbonated for a while. I worked at a couple of other small computer game studios. 
I, I kind of ran the gamut of the digital world where I learned a lot of discipline and met a lot of good people and also learned that I hated that business. Most because I was used to releasing a game every two months. Think of it, test it, print it, ship it, do it again. And the real world doesn't work like that. The real world takes years. Sometimes people in their whole careers work on two or three games and at least one of those never comes out. Uh, and I just could not work at that pace. I had trouble getting what I wanted in the box. And the games that were most successful for me during that period were things that I could prototype on paper because I knew how to do that. So luckily for us, Cheap Ass Games was brought back on off of life support based on the miracle called Kickstarter. So phase three of our operations was based on everyone coming to me in 2012 and 2013 and saying, have you, have you looked at Kickstarter? It's pretty cool. It's a way, and of course you know this, but it's a way that creators can skip the risk of printing a thing that maybe nobody will buy by raising the money to print it before they spend the money to print it. It's a miracle. And so we came back with Unexploded Cow um, in 2013 as our first Kickstarter project. Unexploded Cow, if you're not unfamiliar with this game, it is a story about entrepreneurs who have discovered two problems with a common solution, mad cows in England and unexploded bombs in France. You take the cows, you run them through the fields, you discover and neutralize the <laughs> unexploded bombs, and everyone is happy, with the possible exception. <laughs> well, they were just, they were gonna be mad no matter what. Um, this is a game that I really liked, and it was the only game which during phase two, which is the hiatus period, we had not put in a better home. So Kill Dr. Lucky, we had licensed to Paizo Publishing, so that game continued to exist. Lord of the Fries and Give Me the Brain were at Steve Jackson Games. The big idea uh, was at Fun Forge. This guy. Find this, it's really good. Um, but Unexploded Cow, we tried to sell it, we, we, we failed. So we said, okay, here's a good game, we own it, let's do a souped up version of this, bring it back on Kickstarter. And that worked well enough that that became our new business model. About every six to 12 months, we brought in another game. I think we've done something like a dozen campaigns. Is that more or less right? Most of them were for new editions of old games. So Kill Dr. Lucky, for example, <laughs> we, made, we scheduled to get the rights back from Paizo and said, we're gonna bring that back in house uh, for the 20th anniversary edition. The print run ran out a little faster than we thought, so that we wind up calling it the 19 and a half anniversary edition, which is kind of our style anyway. Um, and the only games that we brought into through Kickstarter that were brand new were games that we knew were going to be big. Both of them happened to be associated with Patrick Rothfuss, who's an author with a really big following. The first one was Pairs, uh, which is a real simple card game. That's not really a part of Patrick Rothfuss's books, but we used his IP on the deck so that people who liked those books might like the deck, and he was our uh, largest mouthpiece in terms of advertising that game to, to potential backers and brought in a lot of people and sold a lot of copy of, of, of Pairs. Um, Pairs, at this point, has more than 40 different games you can play with that same deck, and, and uh, I would say more all the time, although I'm not currently working on any. Last year, Game Trade Magazine ran a brand new Pairs game every month. So those 12 games are above and beyond everything that you can find in the companion book. And at some point, I mean, I, you know, this is all stuff that I need to work out with, uh, with my new friends in St. Louis, but we need to do a collection of those games all in one place because Pairs is a powerful deck anyway. So that was a successful campaign. And the other novel thing that we did was TAC, which we talked about before. During the Pairs campaign, I convinced Patrick to let me promise that we would work on a game that really is in his books. Uh, TAC is the chess of his books, and it is described in the books very vaguely, which is on purpose. Pat doesn't talk about rules or how many turns it takes to win or anything about parts or pieces, really, because he knows that that would paint him into a corner, and that makes it very easy for someone like me to come along <laughs> and say, okay, all you really said in your book is this game is awesome. Let's work to that. Um, and really what he does talk about is that it's such a traditional game and such a sort of well-known abstract that the goal isn't to win as much as it is to play it beautifully, to play a beautiful game. So that was our tagline for the game, that was our goal for the design process, is like whatever else we do here, this needs to come off 
beautifully. It needs to be a game that you can play with elegance and style, and, and you know, it's a nice starting point. Uh, I also had starting points of chess and Go and Mancala and plenty of other existing traditional games to sort of draw from and say, is this within the scope, is this within the scope? To do an old, an old game, to do a, a, a thousand year old game, there's rules. You don't want words, you don't want printing on the pieces. Um, you don't want a difficult to manufacture component. You want something that's so traditional that people really don't need to buy it. And I think that was actually something kind of people enjoyed about this campaign is that we put the rules out in beta six months prior to the opening of the campaign to try to, first of all, get feedback on the game and make sure it was good, but also to get people playing it and get people to know about it. And it's easy to build your own set. And we were okay with that. Uh, and I think, I think our fans kind of enjoyed that. And they certainly supported it regardless of its being free. Um, I love to do that when I can. I love to write ancient abstract games. Uh, I'm now developing three different IPs in which I hope to make a bunch of games. Uh, so that's just, that's my fun thing. So that brings us to uh, the end of phase three, really. Um, the Cheap Ass Games in Black and White was our, as I said, 12th or 13th Kickstarter project. And the last one that we did independently, we have now licensed the whole catalog to Greater Than Games. Greater Than Games is picking us up to do a better job of marketing, distribution, sales, you know, shipping, all the things that I hate doing out of my house so that I can continue being a game designer so that my wife can move on to a better paying job um, and, and so, uh, so that all can be right with the world. And that is, uh, that's where we are now. So I'm actually writing uh, a, a pretty big game. Uh, they, we're calling it a 4X game, but that's not really right. But it's a resource management territory control game. It's got a map and pieces and boards and cards you buy and all the stuff that you expect in a, in a good quality game. For them right now, uh, uh, I've been working on the core mechanics for of this game for about six months. I've been working on the idea for this game for like two years, but this particular version, six months. Just played it with them a couple of times this weekend. It seems to be working really good. I'm excited about that. And that's about all I can tell you about it, but look for that to come out maybe as early as two years from now. They have a pretty pretty socked schedule, but, but yeah, I'm excited about that. So doing new development work for them, also doing new development work for other publishers. And I am putting together a business plan for what is essentially Cheap Ass Games Mark II. Um, I want to do a design studio that never prints anything, never holds inventory, because the most successful companies these days have nothing. Uh, Uber is a transportation company that owns no cars. Uh, Expedia is a, is a travel agency that owns no hotels, right? Uh, McDonald's is a fast food company that makes no food, sorry. I didn't <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but really what I'd like to do is do those sort of guerrilla skunk works projects that I used to love to do and in phase three never got a chance to. The only new games that we kickstarted were ones that we knew were gonna be huge and worth six to 12 months of investment when I really wanna make silly little games like these. But this time around, I wanna make them in a way that people can just order them directly, print them online, print them themselves. I don't print them, I don't carry inventory. They can be pretty, they can be in full color because color printing is easy nowadays and there's plenty of on-demand board game printers where I can lodge this stuff. Assuming that I don't want to make any money, uh, I can make these games from my own entertainment. And really, from a practical standpoint, that's a place where other publishers could draw if they wanted and said, I like this, let's do a pretty version of that, that's fine. But really, I'm doing it to satisfy my own need to, to crank out this new stack of crazy game ideas that I haven't had time to develop. OK, you've been very patient with me. Where are we? Good. Questions? So this new game, you're going to use an alias, alias, so that people don't this, They don't know my, my, real, my other real super name? Yeah. Uh, so my real name isn't James Ernest. <laughs> uh, my real name is John Miller. And when I moved to Seattle in uh, 1989, I started performing under the name James Ernest because there were already three John Millers well known to the public of Seattle, Washington. There was a congressman, a weatherman, and a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to be confused with a congressman. Uh, no, I couldn't give away buttons and say, I know John Miller. What was I going to do? So I, I, I uh, had a, a performing name already in the SCA, if you know what that is, Medieval Reenactment Re Group. That was my grandfather's name, James Ernest, and so I started performing under the name James Ernest, which is kind of a, you know, average-ish name, but it's not nearly as common as John Miller. 
And the first book I published was a juggling instruction book called Contact Juggling. It was about how to roll a ball around on your hands. That was a controversy that we don't have time to talk about in this, but go look it up. Um, and I published the book under that name because it was my stage name. And pretty soon that name bled all over my whole life. So by the time I was publishing games, James Ernest is just who I was. But yeah, not only have I considered doing new publications under a different name, I might already have done so. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Uh, I, a lot of the phase one games are so super simple, Devil Bunny, things like that. Yeah. Um, uh, and then some are a little bit more, more fiddly. What was the hardest to actually complete, to, to really? Oh, well, Dice Land by, by far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wish I had an example here, but uh, so Devil Bunny needs a ham. Adorable little game. I played it again yesterday. It has no right to be as good as it is. Like, it's a throwaway game. It's silly, a little game. And... Devil Bunny itself is based on a series of Dada comic books that I had done built on clip art. So when I did Devil Bunny Needs a Ham, I was already well deep into this universe of this crazy... Let me just read you the cover if you don't know it. You and your friends are living pleasant and complete lives in Happyville. You are highly trained and well-paid sous chefs who have decided to climb to the top of a tall building as fast as you can. Devil Bunny Needs a Ham. And he's pretty sure that knocking you off the building will help him get one. Perhaps he is right, perhaps he is not. Like this, this backstory, this backstory is a joke about backstories, really. You know, uh, it, this game's about climbing a building. That's fine, but like, none, none of this is necessary. That's that's the obvious truth. But did, did the game come first? The game came first? Uh, no, no. I mean, the Devil Bunny character came first. Like, like again, he he preexisted this. The first Devil Bunny product was called Devil Bunny and the Perfect Turkey, and it's a comic book, a twelve-page comic made from a single sheet of holiday clip art, on which this creepy. You can't really see him, but this creepy Easter bunny, this black silhouette Easter bunny just staring at you with these dead eyes, clearly had to be the protagonist. So he adventures through Happyville and finds the seven founding fathers in search of the perfect turkey. He's got a magic spell that was taught to him by the great pumpkin. You know, just everything I could do to turn all this clip art into a story was the beginning of the Devil Bunny over, you know, and it's always been chaotic. And after that, it was a Devil Bunny Christmas, which was um, a bunch of holiday, it was a bunch of Christmas clip art where a bunch of Santa Claus clip art is playing characters who are clearly not Santa Claus. They're, they're, they're creepy guys, right? But it's, it's, it's all written rhyming verse and it's all a, a Christmas favorite, you know, uh, a comic. And, and all of these are available for free, by the way, all these, these comics, download them and, and read them. The third one is called How the Elephant Got Its Spots. And it barely, it has Devil Bunny in like the main thread, but there's like all, the, all these other threads and like works of short fiction and like disjointed weirdness in it. Uh, my two favorite characters of all of my work are Mike and Steve. They just appear in opposite uh, uh, columns on the, on the margins and they talk on the phone. So you have to look over here to see what Mike is saying and then you look over here to see what Steve is saying. And, uh, and so that was, I was in, that was the world I was in when I made this game. And... I, I don't know if it's possible to tell whether the climbing the building idea or mechanic was first because I'm sure it all happened in an afternoon, right? Um, and it's a silly little game and you roll dice and move counters up the building and there's spots you're afraid of because they contain bugs or Wesley Snipes and if Devil Bunny wants to, he knocks you off the building and you fall and other climbers catch you or if not, you can perish if you fall too far. Like, it kind of holds together and it kind of ends and uh, you can kind of play it and that's all you really want for two dollars. We used to do uh, uh, live action Devil Bunny at conventions where we would tape, tape the building out on the floor, give everybody chef's hats and have someone in a Devil Bunny like costume like knocking them off the building. <laughs> Hilarious. So that probably came together in a week. Not my record by the way. My record for fastest game from no idea to printed and going into envelopes was four hours. <laughs> I'm not bragging. It's not a great game. No, it's an okay game. It's called Putt Woody's Castle. It's an abstract that's in the Chief Herman's collections and it's, you're just putting colored stones on a grid basically um, and the color of the stone and the neighbors tells you how many points you get. It's, it's a very simple game but I played it by myself I had, a, I had a, a working version in an hour. I had it, you know, cut and printed in four hours and, and shipping it out. But, uh, and that wound up in a collection. I didn't change anything, so it must be at least that good. We have a, 
we don't, I don't actually have the stamp yet, but we have the idea of the magazine quality stamp, which is if you're writing a Paris variant to go in a magazine, there's a certain point at which you're like, okay, magazine quality, it's good enough, chunk, send it out, don't stop working, make the next one. Those Paris games were good though. That, that, that last year of Paris games were good. Anyway, we're talking about Diceland though. So Diceland has an incredibly complicated history, which I'll try to, to abbreviate here, but at SlugCon, Toivo and I inventing a dice game on the table when nobody was there, we invented a dice game that was upon request. A friend of mine who worked at Wizards came over and said, he, he says, you're a game designer, right? I have this idea. I want a collectible dice game you can play in a bar. Actually, he didn't say dice game. I want a game you can play in a bar. I would like it to be collectible because collectible is kind of a thing now. But I want a game you can play in a bar. And I said, all right, if it's a dice game, the dice are waterproof. If this is all the components you need, it fits in a little tiny bag or a tube or something. You play it on the bar, the, comp the components get wet. It doesn't matter. Let's make it a really quick, like a betting game or something. So Toivo and I invented a game that was called Dogfight that eventually became called Zodiac or vice versa. The Zodiac version was each character was three eight-sided dice with a different distribution of numbers on. Uh, Dogfight is the generic, you can play this with any eight-sided dice version of the same game. But you throw your dice into play. It's the chief numbers, right? It is. Yeah, it I is. That. Yeah. yeah. Um, my, my goal with this was my only components are dice, so what is the most information that I can get out of a die? And it's not just what number it lands on, but it's where it is and where it's pointing. Eight-sided dice have triangular faces, so they have directions and they can shoot. So as once you land all your dice in play, then starting with the low numbers, which are the fastest ones, they shoot each other and they capture each other. Maybe the highest numbers go first. I forget. In Zodiac. But this is just like, okay, we have very simple components. Let's squeeze as much information out of them as we can. So that was the thing. I took this pitch to this guy I, literally a week later, because it was right, at, you know, right before and right after that con. I showed him... The, the, the Zodiac mechanic, and he said, yeah, did I say I wanted a game you can play in a bar? I think, I guess what I meant was a game about owning a bar. Everyone wants to own a bar. It's everyone's goal to own a bar. It's my goal to own a bar. In fact, what I really want is to own a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and so for the first of many times, I'm left holding a bag of game that, that somebody asked for but then didn't want. And I have no idea what to do with it. So it sits around for a while, it becomes a free game, we give it away at Origins, we put it in the program book and we put it in Chief Herman's. The Chief Herman's Holiday Fun Pack and Chief Herman's Next Big Thing collections are booklets of games we had given away for free. They are, pound for pound, the most game you can get in a book. I think I have them here. Well, yes I have. Um, these booklets are printed in their entirety within the black and white book too, right? But these little guys came with an envelope and a couple of boards for a couple of the games that needed them. But most of it's just games in the books. Um, those are, those are good, good finds if you can find them. So a few years later, a, um, a game company came, came to me and said, I want a game I can put in a Happy Meal, a literal Happy Meal. And I said, well, you know what would be cool is, instead of, or as well as, components in the box, why not die cut the box? Because it occurred to me at that point, what I said earlier about printing on paper dice, that because it's so hard to read molded plastic, let's print paper, fold it up into a die shape, play the same game, but with like characters. Here's a, here's a picture of Ariel or Iron Man or whatever on this die with a minimal amount of game information. And now it's kind of cool and collectible and pretty. Well, they passed on that too. Um, but, uh, but that got me thinking, okay, maybe I can do this between figuring out how to do the engineering on the paper octahedra and figuring out how to make what's essentially a collectible miniatures game crossed with a trading card game out of this mechanic. It took me another two or three years. Joshua Howard from Bone Games was my primary, like second developer on this. He's a miniatures game expert. And we went through iteration after iteration of how do I use a minimal amount of dice using the zodiac mechanics of where they are and where they're pointed? Um, we came up with the damage mechanism that I talked about before where you, you will turn the die down when it, when it gets damaged and the face that it shows gets a little weaker. We also came up with the idea that units don't 
die, they just go into the penalty box. So with a really small army, I can do a lot of moves, even when there's a lot of killing, because they're really just going on hold for a turn and then coming back into my reserve, and then if, whenever I want, I can bring them back into play. So if I've got a weenie army and a whole bunch of little guys, they'll all fly out there at once, and some of them will get killed, and eventually they'll come out again. And if I've got a giant, one giant, you know, powerful die, he's all I need, and he just goes out there and runs around and shoots things. Um, so I did that, I did backstory for it. Um, the, the Deep White Sea is the original release for Diceland, which is about five different armies all competing for an icebreaker that's like derelict at the North Pole and they're all trying to like fight each other over it because I thought Ice and Dice and Diceland was a cool name for it. Um, but I think the best Diceland set, if you can find it, is the space set because the mechanics of dice sort of popping into existence and twisting around and shooting each other and then disappearing again don't feel very realistic for a character, but they do make a lot of sense for a spaceship. And the rule book for space, because it was the second generation, was a little bit clearer, a little bit cleaner uh, than the first. But that was easily eight years between what was considered the first concept and what was the final execution. In the book, I actually discovered that it was even older than Dogfight. It was even older than the dice game from SlugCon because looking through all my old catalogs and the calendars, excuse me, before there was a cheap ass game, looking through my notebooks from the mid 90s, Richard Garfield came to my desk while I was at Wizards and said, hey, pogs are a thing because for 18 seconds in the mid 90s, pogs were a thing, right? The, the, they, they, were, they were actually cool in the 80s and then some company bought them all up and said, we're gonna make these cool again and failed. But okay, pogs are a thing. Can we make a game out of pogs that's cooler than pogs? Um, and so that summer, I went to the mall, I bought myself some pogs and a slammer, and I invented a game kind of like this. It was kind of a tiddlywinks game. In this case, you were flipping your, your characters. You had to position them at the edge of the table and then like flip them in to the center, and if you landed them in the center zone, you, they were worth a lot of points. And otherwise, wherever they landed, they were, they were pointing at each other and shooting, and, and it mattered whether they landed face up or face down, but it was a terrible game, but you can see that these mechanics are similar. Like, the, everything sort of feeds into this continuum of getting us to a, to a good place. And if that game sounds familiar, it sounds a lot like a game called Clout, which came out from Peter Atkinson, Jesper Mirforce, Paul, Peter, Paul Peterson, in the mid-2000s, slightly after Diceland, where poker chips are being thrown into the center and, and shooting at each other in, in a similar way. I don't think Jesper, I know for a fact, because I've talked to him about this, I don't think Jesper had played Diceland or cared about Diceland, but I had to ask him while I was doing the research for the book, because he's the inventor of Cloud, did Richard come to you? Because we were all working in the same place. Did Richard come to you and say, Make a game with Pogs because you, you did. And it seems like you might have had the same inspiration that I had when I made my game with Pogs. He said, no, my brother made this up. So I don't know, like uh, that's, that's apparently where it came from. But I was sure that because, because that was an assignment that I got, I'm sure Richard was saying that to other people too, that maybe Esper had heard that. But not true, simultaneous independent development happens all the damn time. Deep impact. I, well, so in the movie business, it's a lot of ripping off. It's like, like someone shops a script around, and people are like, I'm not going to buy that script, but I am going to make that movie, right? Like, I think that happens, too. I don't know in that particular case. But, you know, do the research, find out. That's what I did this time. Um, I always sort of fear that if I make up a game mechanic and don't put it out there, it's only a matter of time before a different game has that mechanic and then it seems like they're the originator of it. And then when I finally get mine out there, they're like, oh, you're just doing this thing. Yes, I came up with the same answer they did and we did it independently, but they got to market first. That's always, I'm always afraid of that, right? But, uh, but it, it, it doesn't happen all that often because I publish games in four hours. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what do we got? Yeah. Years ago at Gen Con, I think it was John Zinger, uh, AG, 
I guess you to make a game you could play on the ceiling. I don't know if you remember that. Nope. Okay, come on. John Zinzer asked me to write a game where you can play on the ceiling. I don't remember that at all. Did it work? Did we do that? Uh, do you use laser I don't, know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer for this question. <laughs> I, it hasn't been four hours yet. <laughs> so no, I, I don't remember that. Yeah, next year for sure. Yeah, everyone looks up, though. We're doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who plays those games in movie theaters? Does anyone ever do that? Or download the app and play the game in the theater? No? No. They, they, they have that where I live. They're like, download the app right now. This amazing game is about to happen. And then, like, there's spaceships on the screen and then another preview. Yeah? So, whenever it comes to game mechanics, I noticed that several of your games like taking established mechanics and flipping them on the rear. Yeah. Like, Kill Dr. Lucky, you get to move more than once in a row. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, is that is that a common theme for a lot of your games where you just go... Hey, what would happen if? I think it's even more in ter common in terms of story. Taking stories and flipping them on their heads or trying to mix together two things that don't normally seem like they mix. Um, so Kill Dr. Lucky is definitely an inversion of the murder mystery since we're all murderers. And I think the murder mystery genre sets everyone up as a potential murderer. That's the point. That's why it's a mystery because everybody wanted to do it. I just, you know, step this, the clock back an hour and play that game. It's kind of where I started with this. Dr. Lucky actually were, was, was, was originally, um, I'm not going to say originally, it's, you, know, you, you understand the genre that it's based on, but when I was in college, I, I used to spend a lot of time in the computer lab writing short stories, just garbage short stories to blow off steam because I was studying math, and that's not fun. And one of these stories was called The Butler Wore Black, and it was such a mystery. Like, the victim was still alive and sitting in the corner of the room and the detective character was grilling everybody about their motives. So this idea was in the back of my head as I'm driving across town one day in March of 1996 and the name Kill Dr. Lucky just jumps into my head. Literally the words Kill Dr. Lucky are so funny because he's lucky, see? He's hard to kill. You try and you try. In the Butler War Black in chapter two they just killed him. Like the lights went out and they all simultaneously built a gallows and hung him in the living room in like 15 seconds, but if he's lucky, it's like Mr. Magoo, he ducks everything, we can try again and again and miss, and that's gonna be hilarious. So that was the idea. Like, Kill Dr. Lucky was the entire game to start with, and by the time I got across town, I kinda knew what it was gonna be. Um, in the book, I have a page of notes from week three of the development of Kill Dr. Lucky. Um, and it just happened to be right around the Gamma trade show because my wife had come back from Gamma. She was working at Wizards then and I wasn't. So I'm sitting at home wishing I was in Atlantic City or wherever this was. Uh, not in, not in 96, but um, uh, she had pitched this idea, sans mechanics, to Darwin Barmley at Mayfair. And he was like, I would buy that game. Let's do that. And I was like, well, hell, if he'll buy that game, I should write that game. So, <laughs> so that's where it all started. Um, and this was before I really had an idea that I wanted to publish it myself. But the reason that Kill Dr. Lucky is game number one from Cheap Ass Games is because of that half dozen games that were done and the other half dozen that worth, were not worth finishing, that was clearly the best one. That's why we led with that game. We knew we were going to do all six of those, but number one was number one for a reason. And in fact, over that summer, um, a well-known game uh, uh, personality who shall remain nameless had been recently put in charge of finding new games for his publisher. So he put out a notice on rec.games.board <laughs> and said, hey, is anyone out there an unpublished designer? Do you have anything you could show me? And I said, well, I have this game called Kill Dr. Lucky. I can show, it to the, I can show you that. <coughs> How much does it pay? I had this nervous tick that I got from freelancing, see, where I always ask, before we get too deep into the deal, how much does it pay? You can die of exposure. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, about 500 bucks. And I said, okay, well, I, this is not, I mean, I've attended a lot of rodeos, so I think this game is worth more than that. And he did literally write back, you know, at this point in your career, it's more important for you to get your name out there than to get paid. And I, of course, I've, I've been to that rodeo too. And, and so I said, if that's the case, why are you trolling Usenet for unpublished designers? 
and it, it just went downhill from there. <laughs> Needless to say, I did not sell him a game or, in fact, become his friend. Uh, but uh, uh, but that's that's one of my favorite stories from that year. It's like, okay, dude, like, uh, go go get a, get someone else who doesn't know what they're doing. But yeah, Doctor Lucky was necessary for cheap ass games. It was great because, among other things, you don't need a lot of parts to play that. And people are, are really, you know, fondly remember using paper clips and wads of paper for their pawns. And my impression was that people would get one really nice set of components and use that for all their games. <clears throat> That's not how it turned out. People really just liked using the cheapest crap they could throw in the envelope. When I was at Wizards, I pitched to them the idea of what I called Chief Herman's Games at that time, um, which was a separated bits pack and games. The games, like cheap ass games, would come without those parts because they were all engineered to use these parts. And so you could buy a really nice bits pack once, like a, like a Xbox, and then buy the games at the price of Xbox discs. You know, well, I'm sorry, those are really expensive, but like at a reduced price considering that you're not repurchasing all the same generic components, right? We have games like that now, like Time Stories. Well, they, we had games like that when I was in high school. It's called Dungeons and Dragons. It doesn't come with the dice, right? It's a very familiar way to sell games. But, um, and in fact, well, I mean, Monopoly used to come in two boxes. It wasn't two separate purchases, but like the board itself was huge, and then the components were this big. So it was two, two packages, right? Um, not that you bought them separately or use them for anything else, but no idea is that new. Um, uh, so Wizards wasn't interested in that because who would want to sell games for less money? But that was kind of the basis of cheap ass games, except I didn't do the bits pack to start with. I just presumed, okay, let's use bits everyone can find, uh, and just did the did the games. Well, any more questions? We're running down to the end of the hour, and I know I've wandered all over the room, but uh, what else can I tell you? I, I hope you've had a good time. It's good to see all of you. Have you ever seen a, a mechanic somewhere else before? Uh, no, I often think, damn, I did think of that. No, no, no. Uh, um, you know, so let's talk about games and mechanics and how they're not the same thing. This is, this is part of my design lecture, I guess, but for me, and I like to think of myself as slightly more average than most, if that's possible. When you say, I'm going on a road trip, I answer, where are you going? And it seems like people who are really into games, when you say, I'm going on a road trip, they will say, what kind of car do you have? And it's fun to be fascinated by that, but I don't personally care. Uh, so I'm certainly impressed by game mechanics, but for me, game mechanics are an answer to a problem. They are not themselves the goal. They are a way to get where I want to go. And the destination of a game is the fun. The, whatever the fun is, the emotion of the game, whether it's just raucous laughter or, or critical thinking or anything in between, um, none of that is based on a specific mechanic. And so people come to me and say, why haven't you ever made game in category X? And I'm just like, well, that's not where I start. So if I ever wind up with a story for which mechanic X is the perfect mechanic, I will do that, and I, and I have, but I don't ever like start there because um, I don't care as much about the car as I care about where I'm going. No. So, so like in Doctor Lucky, where you can move more than once on your turn, yeah, that wasn't the start. Of, that was no. In fact, that was a byproduct of a rule that I thought was essential. So, what he's talking about is that the way you take multiple turns and kill Doctor Lucky is that every time Doctor Lucky moves into a room with you, it's your turn again. So, and because he follows a predictable path, all you have to do is walk in front of him and get turn after turn after turn. In the original build of that game, that also got you a lot of cards and it was fairly broken, and yet we left it in because people like the game. You don't fix it if it's, right? But in the 19 and a half anniversary edition, I finally stripped it down and said, look, here's what's wrong with that mechanic. It's not taking multiple turns, it's drawing all those cards. So I just took that out. I said, you can't draw a card if someone's looking at you, and that includes him. So take all the turns you want, you're just doing a long move. The reason the mechanic is in the game is because, I'm not really for a story reason, but if you want to lie in wait for Dr. Lucky in a perfect room with a perfect weapon for that room and kill him when he comes to you, in real life, 
You would kill him when he comes to you. But in the abstraction of a board game, it has, also has to be your turn. Therefore, if, if we don't have the turn jumping rule and you wait in the white room with the lens cloth or whatever the white room weapon is, if it's not your turn, you, he just walks right through you. That's why that mechanic is so essential to that because the board is about hiding and lying in wait for the old man and it's not about the clock being perfect or else he will phase through you. So it becomes your turn. Um, and an upshot of that is, yeah, well you could use that. You can walk in front of him and it becomes your turn again. And the only way that you can, other, sorry, other ways you can prevent that would be to make him move randomly, which is just bad for the game. Predicting where he's gonna go is part of the strategy of the game. So we, we sort of, the upshot of that is multiple turns and in the early versions multiple cards. And we were just like, okay, that's what the game is, learn to do that. Um, in the original game, you could also get stuck in a room that you never visit, or stuck in a hallway, and then never get a turn. If you were a new player, you could make one mistake and never get another turn. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so among other problems, we fixed that. Now he visits every room, and the rooms he doesn't visit, you don't have to count as part of your move. They're free. You're gonna end up, he's gonna end up walking into you. Not only that, but in the original version, Move cards could move him so that he could get off track. And if you were about to get woken up, someone could screw that and have him jump right past you and you were right back waiting again. So that's why move cards can't move Dr. Lucky anymore. It's about lying in wait for him and knowing that he will eventually come to visit you. Uh, we also shrink the board for less players and, and we do a bunch of other stuff to accommodate. We have the pet rules, which are great, to accommodate more and less players and you know, make the game like deliver on the promise better than the original version did. Uh, but, but that is the reason, the, the, the reason for that. It is a mechanical explanation. What I just told you is a mechanical explanation for why the turn jumps around. But it's still based on the story of hiding, waiting, killing. <laughs> there was, on that board too, there were spaces where you couldn't be drugged forever because he, yes. he would go, he would jump a room and then you would Right, he does move faster than you, so you can't, you can't trail him along forever in the old board. But you, 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 I need to get the new game. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, so um, there should still be an article online about all the changes to like why we did it, you know, a little bit more about what I just did. But, um, but uh, yeah, the hallways were meant to break that chain up, uh, but we found a better way to do it. How do we get your book? Greater than games will be selling it when, when, it's, when they have it. Um, it has not gone out for proofs yet. So it's, the, the campaign's gonna ship roughly in October, and so whenever all of that is out, then you'll be able to mail order from, great, from greater than. Um, I don't know where, if they're gonna be able to place it in bookstores and whatnot, but I'm, I, it won't be hard to find. Yeah. I, you say you look at a, a Kickstarter models. For game publishers that fail on Kickstarter, what seems to be the, the reason for it? Your product is terrible. <laughs> um, the question is, why do, why, do, why do games fail on Kickstarter? And um, they don't. Here's what's great about Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a question to which the answer is sometimes no. God does answer your prayers. Sometimes the answer is no. If you, Kickstarter is, would you guys like to buy this if I made it? And if not enough people say yes, you're out the relatively low cost of running a Kickstarter campaign instead of the incredibly high cost of printing a game and hoping somebody will buy it. So I never look at a, a failure on Kickstarter. And I, of course, I'm speaking from a position of privilege. I've never failed on Kickstarter, but I've worked with companies that have, and I, I advise them to look on that failure as a success. Because now for relatively little money, you've figured out that there's something about your product that's not clicking. Fix that. Try it again, and it doesn't cost you much. So, so that, that's my opinion about Kickstarter. I, th I think that's why it's so great. It's not sort of just that it's an effective pre-order system that everyone uses it for. It's also, if you want to do something that's crazy, might be nobody wants that. And it's great to know that before you sink a lot of money into it. I have a $200,000 text adventure game. <laughs> Every campaign is different. 
All right, well, we're a little bit over time. I want to thank all of you for coming and uh, have a good rest of your show. I'm uh, fairly easy to find. I don't tweet very much, but I'm on Twitter at, at CheapAssJames. And uh, by, uh, by next spring, I hope to have launched my new enterprise, which I think is going to be called Crab Fragment Games, uh, which is just hopefully crazy free stuff that nobody else wants, which I will put out uh, to, see, to see if I can get people to want it. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody.